So instead of having every facilitator report out, I'm just going to invite facilitators, if you have something that really struck you in your session that you want to share, would you just unmute yourself and go ahead and share? I can start by saying one thing that was shared in our, um, our session was talking about like food redistribution, often like in the way that food is package now with people getting boxes and not having that shopping cart model that people are getting things that they may not want or may not fit within their dietary needs and what are the mechanisms to have that food go back into um, a place where they can be redistributed so that there's not a waste happening so it's a different kind of food recovery Yeah, I, we had several people in our ex, uh, food access group talking about mental health needs of people when they're doing home deliveries or uh, even seeing the school buses delivering foodstuffs through the LC Valley going, you know, to, around the school routes and house to house kinds of delivery. Uh, there are major stressors throughout people's lives, not just about hunger and uh uh, food insecurity. So how do we address those and partner better with uh, behavioral health experts in our region? Yeah, that's really important partnerships. And we were also saying, you know, speaking along that is just the access to the isolated groups. And so, you know, the senior communities or those that aren't in a position to get out and get where they need to go because of the situation. So, um, and distribution of the excesses then, how, how, how to best that those are problems that will remain beyond the pandemic. Our group talked about the ongoing need for regional USDA poultry processing. And we really talked about it on when we went through every single question. And it it's just this thing I think we talk about every year at the Food Summit. And so maybe now's our opportunity to do something about it, take some action. I know the co-op would really benefit from having locally processed birds, but I think all the producers would benefit from that too. We also talked about uh, USDA meat processing and you know, building on that. And again, that that's been something that has been an issue for a very long time. And you know, I think maybe we need to look at some other partners, like maybe Partnership for Economic Prosperity or bringing in some of those economic development partners because the cost of developing these types of um, infrastructure is so expensive. And I think that that's part of why it hasn't happened is that financially it, it is a huge burden. I was really excited to see that Drew is thinking about doing that with the Asaka facility. Our, our group with production um, really emphasized the economic loss um, from restaurant sales to producers and how to buffer that moving forward. That was something that was a pretty strong thread. Um, one of the responses that was offered by um, Anne um, in our group, she, she mentioned that down... Um, in I think Lapway, anyway, down on the, on the, with the tribe, there were gifts, gift cards from indigenous restauranteurs for like some of targeted towards some of the elderly shut-ins that weren't really able to cook for themselves anymore. And they were able to be given um, hot food, which was really valuable for them. And so trying to kind of connect all those pieces of the food system to production with the trickle down effects. Our group was about access, but we, Nancy talked about uh, what WSU is doing by enclosing restaurant gift cards with the food packages that are distributed. And then Linda said something about the possibility of a U.S. government program uh, that's pending involving maybe FEMA to do, to contact area restaurants to help feed at-risk households. And mm -hmm. none of us was really sure about how that goes, but if there's a such a program pending, we'd all love to hear about it. Going back to some of the things the other production group talked about, we also talked about the sales to restaurants uh, and some of the opportunities that arose from that was 
um, more CSA shares being available, um, you know, more donations uh, to food pantries as well with some of that food. Uh, and then you see more um, home, home delivery and or those boxes where uh, different producers are partnering with each other and an opportunity to continue doing that. Um, uh, another thing that came up I thought was interesting with this opportunity uh, for woofers um, and um, the ATRA farm program uh, being still available during the pandemic as an opportunity as well. Building on that, our group also talked about the need for storage for individuals and for businesses and farms. So really needing freezer facilities and cold storage. And that, that that's part of household food security um, for many people is to be able to actually store what they hunt and gather. Any other share out? before we move back to our panel to talk about some of the resources available to us to address these needs. Yeah, I'll just share real quick that um, we I was in the food access group and we talked a lot about um, moving forward, what we can do as far as staying community focused. And really what we've learned is that our community is what makes the biggest impact, not just the country, but our real local community here. Um, so how do we keep that momentum staying focused um, from here on out on focusing on local farmers markets, community groups, there was an increase, um, like Will said, in volunteering this year, but we don't want to lose that momentum and have, well, oh, tw in 2020, we had a whole bunch of volunteers, but back to normal. Um, so, you know, just keeping that, that uh, community focus is super important. Yeah, that my my other brief thing kind of piggybacking on the other, we talked about a lot of things you guys shared and just the um, need to stay connected for the farmers. You know, we saw this opportunity where there was a lot of collaboration and we think that that can only strengthen our groups going forward and what I don't have, you might have and either we can trade for it or we can also let our customers know that we don't have that, but these guys do and maybe creating some, um, you know, uh, stronger kind of ag communities specifically on through the Clearwater region um, as well. So, yeah. Okay. Nancy? Yeah, I was just going to say, uh, it sounds like it's time to reintroduce our panel from this morning and uh, have a conversation about regional resources moving forward and kind of close this out on a, an optimistic tone. Uh, as a reminder, our panelists are Dr. John Rushi from the Lewis Clark Valley Healthcare Foundation, Mason Burley from Inovia Foundation, and Colette de Phelps from University of Idaho Extension. Okay. Colette? Wait, Don. Wanna... You want oh. me to go ahead? Yeah. Okay, well. Um, Hello? Oh, okay. I'm not muted, am I? No, no you're not. Um, I, it's always hard to predict the future. Um, the, um, but I, I think that we're likely to see about six uh, to nine months of continued COVID stress. Um, the uh, restaurants and whatnot will not be able to be, will not be at, at uh, able to open up and have the uh, uh, businesses that they want. Um, and I think the, that much of the economy, while it will improve, will still have a lot of unemployment over the next six to 12 months. Not as long um, a recovery as, as 2009, 2010, 2011, but uh, still it's going to be another six to nine months. So we're going to have to continue to be looking for resources and, and ways to continue that. I think I stress the not-for-profit stressors, uh, volunteers, and no, no, uh, and not having as much resources will continue. Um, and I think when we come out of this, we're going to find that there'll be a number of not-for-profit agencies that are no longer in existence. Um, they may have consolidated, they may have developed cooperation. And I'm hoping that there's more standardization so that us funders can have a better idea of where to put money that makes the, mo the most good. I think that longer term projects um, that we see in our impact uh, uh, 
program will likely be on the back burner through this year. Um, and uh, uh, so if there are people that are interested in having longer term uh, ways to, to create systems that, that meet needs rather than uh, uh, responding so immediately to a need, I think this would be a good time to start planning what those might look like. And as far as the uh, Lewis Clark Valley um, Health Care Foundation, we will be continuing both our fast track and impact grants, probably continue the same size, about a third of a million dollars into the fast track and the remainder on the impact. But we'll see what, what happens over the next several months with uh, um, our, the perceived needs that our Board of Community Advisors has. And we may ask uh, Mason and, the, and Anovia with their um, uh, insight and the data that they acquire as to how that, work, how that would best work as well. So that's what I see. I'll, I'll, Nancy, should I jump in here? Or? It's always hard to follow Dr. Rushi, but I'm going to do my best. I think, you know, I, I really appreciate the chance to be here today and to hear from all of these organizations working hard to, to meet basic needs and to have sustainable um, futures for, for this region we all care about. In looking forward, I think the biggest thing is just staying connected. And so when we think about maybe some resources or some what comes next. I know in the immediate term at the foundation, we'll work with all those multiple partners and our, our leadership councils to do a third round of COVID um, funding. Um, I think you can see that food security was a priority for us as well as um, you know, small town and local rural food supply. Um, so please keep us in mind and look out for that. I don't have an announcement about the date, but that will be coming soon. Um, in addition, you know, we want to support your efforts. I, I like I emphasized, um, we appreciate the chance. It's, you know, a privilege to be able to grant out like as a funding partner like we do, but there's also some supports we can offer. Um, Dr. Rushi mentioned the data aspect that we jointly fund a data hub, and I'm going to put the, um, the URL in the chat there. It's a um, regional data hub that's actually curated data from the University of Missouri Extension Program, but there's networks all over the country that use this. And there's thousands of um, publicly available data sources in there, some of it on food security, but also some of it on agriculture and production. And as you're applying for grants or communicating with your stakeholders, that might be one way um, to be able to access some information quickly. And there's a training video on there. Secondly, just capacity building in terms of letters of support. If we can't fund a project, we can get behind it with some ways to support it. And you know, I think one of the blessings from COVID has been to um, kind of make sure we reach out and you know learn about organizations we haven't before, work um, in ways we haven't before as well. So that's what we think of as capacity building. Um, then finally, um, uh, partnerships. You know, I think we we do better when we work together, like the um, volunteer at the St. John Endicott Food Bank said, it's, you know, working as a team, we can get more done. And that's what we've done in the past. This is a photo on the left here of a um, support we provided the community action centers for the PLUS um, tables project. And I know many organizations here were involved with that as well. Um, we want to be able to kind of um, where, see where we can provide support that maybe catapults other efforts as well. So I know we have, we've had community grant competitive rounds. We typically get about six to one in terms of applications to what we can fund. If you're not funded in a competitive round, that doesn't mean you should shut, you know, you still stay connected either through directly or through your kind of umbrella organization because we never know really what's around the corner. As Dr. Rushi said, prediction is hard, especially about the future. Um, but I do know that um, we, things come up unexpected. So just I'll close by saying that w one thing we're doing right now is the Schultz Family Foundation came to us, um, the Starbucks fame, and they wanted to fund some capacity building in food banks in this area. So we're able to fund an AmeriCorps um, person at Community Action Center at Northeast Hunger Coalition. And then I just learned we're also funding some support from specialty mobility services that um, Transports medical supplies are also going to be transporting some food boxes in, in Northeast Spokane. 
So those are some ways that, you know, we try to be a networker and a convener to make things happen um, and to support the great work you're doing. So thank you so much for having us here today. Thank you. Thanks, Mason. Uh, Colette, how about we move on to your, your comments next? Thank you. Just really for me, building upon what Mason and Dr. Rushi said is that engaged community is really, I think, one of our strongest assets that we have. We also have new people engaged in local food and agriculture. There is an increased appreciation of and interest in local food that has come along through COVID-19 and also a wider public understanding about some of the fragilities in our international and larger food systems. So this interest in local agriculture, local food systems, and how to build the, the, these food systems is greater. We're also seeing, not necessarily directly related to COVID, but through some of the reach that, research that's been done, how this actually benefits our local economy and provides jobs. And ultimately, like, people need to have a good income to be able to access food and housing and other resources. So we are all doing this amazing work to provide um, resources and connectivity to people. But we also, I think, need to really be starting to look at some of the systemic underpinnings of the challenges that we face. And how can we come together to be able to work on these more systematically? And I really heard a, a strong call for that from many people. Plus, just there's some incredible models that are happening and many of them are coming from our Native American communities and the tribal leadership that we're seeing around food sovereignty initiatives. So paying attention to those and then really using this new interest and the connectivity that we've been able to essentially hone in on because we've learned to work in a virtual world. And with that, we have the ability to reach more people, to bring in more dialogues and to do more joint work where we can make a difference. And I'm like so impressed by the work that Crystal Schwartz has done around poultry processing and using social media to link into different groups to really identify the need and the interest. So leveraging new energy and new leadership and then using these tools that we have to bring people together across our communities, including our very rural spaces is going to be important. And then building on these cross sector collaborations, a number of people have talked about that. We've seen some amazing things with our cities, our chambers, our local business initiatives. The North Central Idaho Food Access Working Group is going to continue to be working together to meet immediate, immediate needs, looking to the future. How do we build more partnerships? How do we influence um, funding that is coming from our government so that local farmers can have their food in these farm to families boxes? Those, all those things make a difference and it's us working together to be able to have the voice to make those things happen. And I'm really excited about Fair Idaho focusing on our entire food system and the independence within that, our family farmers, our independent restaurants, bars, food processors, being a voice to our policymakers for all of these issues. So I think that we have new relationships, we're learning how to use new tools, and it's really going to be the passion of us as a community and the collaborations that we forge that are gonna make the change. And we do have, these organizations like Lewis Clark Valley Healthcare Foundation, Anovia, and others that are able to put resources and provide opportunities to channel uh, resources into these efforts, which is super key for us to be able to move forward. Does anybody else have anything that they would like to add about resources or what they see as some of the keys to moving forward to address the issues, needs, opportunities that are before us? Well, I have something that I'd like to add. Sure. Um, so I've heard a lot about collaboration. Um, I know we have several folks on here representing um, producers, growers, other farmers markets, um, outlets, 
And I do just want to say that um, Idaho does have a statewide association called the Idaho Farmers Market Association. Um, and they have really focused on the one thing that um, I'm the secretary uh, for the board. The one thing that I think we do really well is making sure that farmers markets are getting up and running with SNAP and EBT, providing um, double up food bucks. Um, and right now we're exploring the idea of what a senior nutrition program could look like um, in addition to working with the Idaho health and welfare at the state level to really push them to get WIC checks um, that you typically use at the grocery store into farmers markets. Um, so if there are folks that are interested um, in being a part of that conversation um, and, it, and helping bolster that statewide uh, association, I encourage you to check out um, their website. Um, and again, we really want to be the voice for farmers markets when it comes to food access. So rather than markets who maybe don't have the capacity to be trying to fund these things themselves, um, I know the farmers market has uh, benefited extremely this past year when our funding fell through from the Washington side of things because we are a border market. Um, they were able to help fill in our funding gaps with a uh, backyard harvest. And so um, if, you, if you're involved with those kind of networks, I, I really encourage you to, to look at the IFMA and, and see how they can support your farmers markets in your communities um, and helping to, to fund those things because it, it really reaches um, a subset of, of folks that I think do get left behind in the conversation. And then it's beneficial to those vendors and producers at those markets where um, they're reaching folks that they might not necessarily work with. So I just wanted to put in a little plug and as we're talking about these sort of cross-pollination and cross-networking, um, keep them in mind. Thank you, Amanda. Any other resources that anyone would like to share? Okay, well, I want to hand over the mic to Willow um, to talk about our Local Food Leader Award. You're muted, Willow. Minor detail, sorry. <laughs> um, I'm Willow and I work in marketing and outreach at the Moscow Food Co-op. I'm thrilled to present the award for the local food leader this year. Um, so each year the Palouse Clearwater Food Summit asks participants as part of their registration to nominate a local food leader for their exemplary contributions to growing our regional food system. Past outstanding local food leader leaders honored at the Food Summit include Cinda Williams, 2017, uh, formerly with U Idaho, University of Idaho Extension, uh, Guy and Beverly Spencer with Renner Bean Ranch for 2018, Misty Amarena, formerly with Backyard Harvest and the Co-op, um, 2019, and Joe Astorino and Ashley Vaughn, with Community Action Center last year. Um, so bear with me just for a second for a little background before I introduce this year's food leader. Um, through my outreach work at the co-op, I've had the pleasure of meeting and working with so many amazing individuals on the Palouse who are working hard to fight food insecurity. Um, so many people are doing their part to make sure our community is fed. And during COVID, people are really working even harder. Um, but one person and the organization they represent truly stands out. Um, this hardworking individual has been fighting food insecurity for years and has just gone above and beyond during these COVID times, working extra long hours to bring food and smiles and love and warmth to those in need. Um, I actually met this amazing human at the Food Summit two years ago. We were at the same roundtable discussion and we started talking about how we could work together, their organization and the co-op, to help the community even more than they already were. So they were at the Food Summit for a completely selfless reason, uh, to make connections and learn more about the local food system in order to reach more and help more people. Not that, for those that know them, the selfless thing is a surprise. Um, but that, along with all other efforts, worked. Hardly a day goes by when they don't swing into the co-op in the evenings for food recovery. And I know that we're just one stop in their very long day. They've worked hard to create a network of stores and individuals to share the passion and understanding that access to food is a human right. They and their amazing organization are responsible for bringing that access to so many and for meeting them where they are. 
they've shared with me the increased need this year because of COVID in our community and the entire organization has gone above and beyond to show the devotion and dedication to the cause with all of the hours that everyone puts in. Olivia Savula and Food Not Bombs of the Palouse, you were voted by these lovely people as this year's outstanding local food leader. All of your hard work has certainly not gone unnoticed. A huge thank you to you, Ollie, and everyone at Food Not Bombs uh, for all that you do every day. The pickups, the deliveries, the sorting, the packing, the cooking, the list goes on. You all are amazing and we're lucky to have you in our community. As you say, Ollie, solidarity. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Ooh, let me show you this. Woo woo. <laughs> Thanks, Ollie. Yes, thank you all. Thank you all are so amazing. It's so wonderful to serve you all in the Palouse. Thank you. Thank Even you. from Hawaii? <laughs> Even from Hawaii. <laughs> Thank you, Ollie. Thank you, Food Not Bombs. Thank you all that presented today and participated. The work you do makes a difference. And the work you do and the support, the solidarity, the collaboration is so important for our joint ability to persevere. There is so much need and there are so many opportunities. And I am really proud to work with you and be part of this community that is growing our local food system Everything you do truly makes a difference. And thank you for joining us in this virtual format for our Food Summit. We really appreciate everything you've done and it just brings tears to my eyes. I'm just so touched and proud to be part of this community. We are going to send you an evaluation. We'd love to hear how this went for you and what you see as some of the next steps. We're gonna be definitely convening and moving forward, creating ongoing work and collaborations, building on these amazing relationships, friendships, partnerships that we have. So thank you again for joining us. We appreciate you. Thank you. And Colette, you said you're gonna leave this chat open in case people wanted to visit. I think she peaced out, but yeah. <laughs> Mackenzie's always up for a party, huh? <laughs> I'll have information in the chat. It'll take me uh, a bit to go through it because I have to like copy and paste and make put it in a way that makes sense, but I'll send it with the evaluation. Great. Mackenzie, I'll type up my notes too from our uh, presenter. It was much easier for me just to write them down, even awesome. after doing the whiteboard training yesterday. Okay. Does anyone want to stay on? I'm happy to leave the meeting open if you'd like. Okay. Again, thank you all so much. Thanks, Hope everybody. to see you in person very soon. Thank you. Thanks. Great to see you guys. Thanks. Bye. Okay, bye. Thank you all. Solidarity. Thank you. Thank you.